Good evening. Welcome to the 46th Joachim Miller Poetry Series. I'm Renee Garrity, your host, along with Henry Crawford and Karen Allenier. We usually have the, the series in the lovely Rock Creek Park, but as you know, the pandemic took us out of there and we've been doing virtual poetry series for two years now. Hopefully next summer we'll be back under the trees. Just a few words of housekeeping. Your microphone is muted so we can ensure the calm and quiet necessary for the readers. Please feel free to use the chat function that's at the bottom of your screen. And you can also clap and chat with each other. So if we were in person, you'd be able to buy the poet's books after the reading. But since we can't, we have developed a way to do it. We put the link to each poet into the chat and you can go there and find where to buy their books. Uh, check, so check the, the Zoom chat for the links. Our first reader is Kristen Kowalski Farragut. We might ask what she doesn't do instead of the things she does do, but I'm gonna give you a quick sample. She teaches, plays the guitar, hikes, and supports her children in becoming who they are meant to be and enjoys the vibrant community in the writing community in the DMV. She is the author of a full length poetry collection, Escape Velocity, and a much needed children's book, Becoming the Enchantress, a magical transgender tale. Wait for it. Both books were published in 2021. That was your year. Her poetry has appeared in journals, including Beltway Poetry Quarterly, Fledgling Rag, Little Patuxent Review, to name a few. Kristen has also been a featured reader at the Words Out Loud and Evil Grin. And excuse me, my screen just went down. Hold on, I'll be back. Here we go. Um, Evil Grin and Third Thursday Poetry. With that, let's welcome Kristen. <laughs> I'm so happy to be here. I um, didn't write poetry for about 12 years when I was extreme mommying. And the first reading I went to when I returned to poetry was the Joaquin Miller poetry reading. And I've wanted to read here for years. So I kind of envisioned I'd take a walk in the woods beforehand and a walk in the woods afterwards, but still the company's great. So I'm happy to be here. So I'm reading um, from my new book, Escape Velocity. And I will start with the poem from which the title came. Change takes energy. Thunderstorms rotate into hurricanes. Rockets hit escape velocity over 25,000 miles per hour. Birthday cake bakes at 350 degrees, the tender perfection. No reason to expect any leftovers. Babies can't loan you 30 bucks and butterflies won't take out the trash upon emerging from the chrysalis. And she isn't the one with whom you tied the knot. Fumbling hands recalling torn through mittens on the rope toe because the hill was just too steep and you never did learn to ski. Gloriously happy with the band on your finger, all that hide and seek behind you. It wouldn't keep you safe or bring you soup, but still a kind of resting place. Buried beneath pills and knives, scars and scarves, you'll never find him now. You fueled the escape and don't quite begrudge it, except in what is misunderstood as finite. All these worries of loss overlook what science shows us. Renewable energy in wind, tides, sun, your heart, and the smile you give your kids after taking out the trash. That was a nod to my children. And here is another poem that was inspired by my children. 
family dinner, a metaphysical check-in. And if you laugh, it's okay, the humor was intended. Angst of youth elemental. Global warming, yes, but we shrunk the hole in the ozone. The Gulf War did not annihilate us. Malthus was proven wrong. Humans are smart, despite evidence to the contrary. An obligatory dinner turned essential discussion. Bullies tend toward halfwit, you're ugly and stupid, as though creativity isn't gorgeous. So we discuss ingenuity and comebacks, places for help, space for ignoring, and expansive possibilities in the transcendental or even God. No one wants the night to end. Full of doubt too, I check myself against pop psychology. Parents, it seems, cause all Gen Z's anxiety. Do I solve too many of your problems? Do I pressure you to be happy? No, they console, as miserable as I was in 87, fretting the end of the world. So a couple of years ago, I planned on having a great midlife crisis and I built up lots of angst, but it only resulted in a lot of guitar playing and a few on theme poems. So this is one of the on theme poems. Midlife legacy. It's not so much that I love my vintage 69T, my maybe it'll help me get used to being 50, winter tax refund splurge, when spring hovered at a civilized distance. I wear it a lot, but imagine it a less deliberate buy. Two bucks at a thrift store and worn thin, a comfortable absence of shape, maybe bought by someone else. 20 years hence, a 20-something girl sips through racks, discovers a gray V-neck vintage 69T, wears it to an Imagine Dragons reunion concert, where the band wears baseball caps and shouts lines, a little hoarse. She's unsure of the guy she's with until they stop at the peak of a bridge en route to home, and he wraps his arms around her hips. She meets him like a sunburn. That start above, there might be other people in the world, but she wouldn't know. This guy is everyone, and she suddenly loves them all, their fingertips and lips, grasps and surprises. He wrinkles her soft shirt in hand. This is deep enough to catch your breath upon remembering at 50. All right, unbearable lightness. Anyone whose goal is something higher must expect someday to suffer vertigo. Lon Kandura from The Unbearable Lightness of Being. Tethered to nothing, we inhale deep enough to ache in hopes that the weight of air will anchor us. When that fails for ballast, we conjure memories of lost teddy bears, chipped teeth, the one that got away, and what we want it to be when we grow up. We cling to the heft of agenda books and plans, fragility that crumbles easily and drifts off as dust. The list of things we believe hold us, breaks our hearts when they dissolve, like playing house. There ought to be a word for psychosomatic hope. The air is full of things blown away from us. The seats of appliances we wanted to return, trash from the car floor, diplomas never hung on walls, romance, hobbies we wanted to be our lives. We anchor ourselves in burdens, lost causes, anything in shadows, of love to keep from floating away, hearts and stomachs empty. So this one is um, just a general love poem to men. And um, the science in it is from facts my children gave me, which were probably from TikTok. So I haven't researched it independently, but it's just a poem. So I'm going to read it. Variation on evolution. Salt bearing value of weight like diamonds, like gold, currency in 2000 BC. Rain in the northern Mojave Desert, salt and spice, tremors of the best kind, the making of continents, merging of mountains. 
A little funny, gender wars in celebration of she, much to love in women, rich with nuance and passion, moonlight and ocean, guardians of a species, but not to the exclusion of he. Voice box that undulates, teasing target for kisses above naked, flat chest, sloping to the root of countless jokes, infinite mysteries, always decisive. I honor the definitive, even when wrong. Relief to my spiraling, meandering, having no idea. I hear sperm can now be made of bone marrow. I hear the Y chromosome lacks genetic diversity. Hints toward extinction. I'll take the pandemic, in my face news, bombs, exploding need and guilt, God's game of hide and seek. Grateful these are my times with bearable seasons and fruit bearing trees while we still have men. This one's a little bit less of a love poem. Waning when the moon is waxing. If only we felt like snowflakes, never crashing, never boring, not loud. We're only human, whirling in our individual little confoundations. We stuff a sock in it to muffle words, Think of something else, turn away. We're not all good actors. Some of us have to not care to look like we don't care. I pray to the God of apathy every day. Using our passions against each other, we try to look sane with poor aim and lack of wherewithal while we tamp down things intended for keeps. Singing, chutzpah, ardor, the want to be heard in the rare conversation that matters. Just shovel it away, the students know. Repress nothing. I don't care if you throw the tire iron, the clank against pavement, as long as you miss my bones. What I missed, you may ask the morning after. If you howl and never explain, it's because you never need a reason. I don't care if you come late and stay too long, even if you don't say a word, you could even leave early, though I'd miss the sigh, weep, row of your breath. Most importantly, repress nothing. I don't care if you cry like a toddler missing his plushie or suck your thumb if you have to. Hell, you can even suck mine. Whatever it takes, keep it circulating. Air, water, blood, ardor, it all needs cleansing. Hiding from the ghost. Not our bare soaked weekends, late morning check ins, calls to end cap the day. End caps like Lowe's aisles of electrical tape and weed killer, or maybe more like sentimental CDs displayed in record stores, not wishes or plans. I, but places void of you. Beside your transaction slips, I kept ledgers of the time not filled by you. Within my height of summer confusion over sweat, dry, wet, AC chills, tender mourning of other men, upon my skin touched by a puff of breeze submerged in a body of water, I hide in rain, snow, heat, things you dislike, extremes, my howling, fever, silence, exercise, whimsy. I move a chunk of the soundtrack to storage. Few favorite haunts let me give up the ghost of you, so I stay home. Console myself that each friend will only ask about you one more time. This one was inspired by Diogenes the Cynic. It's entitled, I'm sorry, it's entitled Expectations High with the Simplest of Desires. Lamp in hand I search, even if in rhetorical pursuit. Take my sentimental mug collection and excess clothing in a rainbow of sizes. Leave my facile cupped hands in one warm flannel. I'm also happy to trade armfuls of sweet to pardon false promises with a view of one robust bow through cracks in my clay walls. I want less and everything, roaming the city, on lookout for one honest man. This 
So for about two years, I drove a truck and I, um, I love driving in the rain. You know, I don't so much love snow. You just can't drive on ice, but my least favorite uh, atmosphere to drive in was wind. I thought that was very difficult. So um, I used some of that imagery in this poem. Wind out of control, loose hair waves, jackets and skirts fly from legs and chest. Trailers cross solid yellow lines. No matter how still you hold the wheel or struggle to adjust, the truck sways for gusts. Hold my affect to overcorrect for your squalls. North, south, east, west, sad tales, wishes, fights to escape and stay still. Often I ask the weatherman, but he gets it wrong. Your hints scatter away. So if you make it and you don't want me to know. This love of what grows wild flowers and tickles my skin is erratic, uncertain, hard to stare down. Epilogue. She forgot the last kiss shared, but finally understood marriage to share another's lips in perpetuity. She couldn't plant them in time, but recalled a string of pre-kisses in cars, dance halls, beds under stars, suspension of mouths meeting, inhaling each other's breath until skin raised skin. Each was her little grasp on immortality. Separated, divorced, single dating, words that sound like potential, like string lights, like the opening bars and drift away. I feel the opposite when reaching into the lampshade to turn out the lights. And here is my final poem. Thank you so much for listening to me. I'm happy to see you all and grateful to be here. The River. Steady before the drop that calls for falling, I fix my feet as though braced in a fight with a lover that's about to get a little violent. Proximity to the precipice speaks of shattering lines and edges for roots that anchor earth to itself. And the way she says, shh, not like the professional shushers at children's theaters, like the old bunny in Goodnight Moon. Dancing light and heady musk inhaled into memory to be unfolded later on my sickbed with the hush of the river's song. So I guess I'm saying the falls are my sister or my mother. Family means solace. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Repress nothing, that's for sure. <laughs> Thank you again. Our next reader tonight is Mark Fitzgerald. Mark is the author of two books of poetry, Downburst and By Way of Dust and Rain. His work has appeared in several anthologies as well as journals such as Santa Clara Review, Crab Creek Review, and Beltway Poetry Quarterly, to name a few. Mark received a Master's of Fine Arts in Creative Writing from George Mason, studied in Strasbourg, France, was awarded a writing fellowship at Oxford and a writing fellowship from the Virginia Center of Creative Arts. He's currently teaching writing and literature at the University of Maryland. Please welcome Mark Fitzgerald. Thanks so much, Renee. Um, and, and thanks, Karen. Thanks, Henry, for all your efforts um, being here for being here tonight and everyone at the WordWorks. It's great to be back and um, really look forward um, to sharing some of my work with you. I, I, Chris, I really liked your, your work. Uh, the images and the tone and, and just the language was, was great. Um, I also sometimes pray to the God of apathy. I like, I like that idea. Um, this first poem is called um, When You're Not Looking, How Sometimes Things Take You By Surprise. The turn will come driving home late from work on a Thursday. The weight of the week behind you in the shower or the park at a concert. The turn will come over tea when you've all but given up. 
anywhere but at the cemetery where you've prayed for it to come. And when it does, you'll see yourself for miles above. All the yellow leaves from the ginkgo drop at once, a bare awakening. Life and death nipping and tugging at the same wild heart. Why you lost your way over hills after the first frost and came back to the meadow as falcons dazzled the morning air. Um, so I'll read another poem, a longer one called Starting Over. Uh, this was inspired by just uh, pre-COVID being able to travel and, you know, kind of um, actually coming from a writer's conference and rethinking a manuscript. But um, anyway, I kind of got the idea uh, right before I caught a plane home. Sleep and set free the slow hours before your plane takes off. Wake and let the cold room be. The portrait of a young woman whose determined eyes follow you around and ask, so soon? Until June, you answer, or so the dream presumes. Until you fly away and see a pink pool of sky splash against night and disappear. Let's pretend the parting note to transform the caravans was no less important the second time around. Pretend nothing blocked your way. The boulder was really a fountain and tremendous fruit and fortune sprang from midnight strides that brought you back to the drawing board. You tried harder and harder and this time would be different. You'd bruise less easily, regret less, trust again in some day, but then what? Rise and set free, fall and let be. Let each breath be a world unto itself, a word, say blossom or river or rain. A sound repeated, the same sound many times at once. Wind chimes jangling on a porch as the sky grows dark and something you can't believe is still within you starts to speak again. Um, this next poem is called Disruption. It, it was kind of generated from a, from a walk I took a number of years ago uh, through a marshland in winter. And uh, it's about winter patterns and kind of the cycles of nature and uh, rebirth. Fallen pines, remnants of a young forest, a violent storm decades ago brought them down and eventually their death brought life to oaks, brought hickories. Sometimes fortitude is a necessary design. How beaches manage to keep their leaves through bitter months. Sometimes I can see the whole wreath shaking, wrapped in the dance of holding on and the crazed sway let go, spinning, twisting, not letting go until a proud gold moon announces the next order. In its cracked bark stillness, winter commands the spring of every season. In the forests surrounding the marshes, it is cold but bearable. For frogs burrowed below frost lines, survival is not much different than living. Walking along frost-covered boards above wetlands, I try to imagine the end of humankind, a swift falling. But from what forces, what creatures would we in the end give way to? A red-shouldered hawk sweeps through cord grass, scaring off a flock of starlings. The most dramatic renewals rise from disruption. It is a pattern in a cycle of patterns, as natural as bubbles trapped below ice. Um, this next poem um, is, is called Hunger. It's from my first collection by way of destiny. And part of, part of the inspiration of this was actually trying to understand 
the many forms of hunger. Um, it grows stronger the more we feed it, thrives too often in the flesh, in the raw pang of wanting, not in the wolf gnawing through the door, but in what keeps the wolf at bay, the expectation, the scent of grilled sausages on the street, the long line at the gallery, not the conjugal visit, but the date scrawled on the prison wall, the impending deal, the prelude, not the monk's transcendence, but his self-denial, a child's dream, not a father's approval. It beats back discontent, the pebble thrown to the lover's window, not the serenade, the last ticket for the first bus out, attainment's delusion and the art of attainment, the sun before it rises. Um, so this next poem is, is a bigger poem called Tabula Rasa. I, I wrote it even before my first collection and then wasn't happy with it and came back to it a little bit and decided to put it in and downburst. Um, Tabula Rasa. If there's no other way out of bed to pull on our socks, lock the door, pay the tab, close our eyes. If the human condition is unconditional, then whatever we do or think we can do is but a hiss through the thistle. Then the stars, despite our wishing, are meaningless. Despite ash and incense, furious winds, a lick of tears, the thumping rain, if sunrise after sunset won't redeem us. Say the oracle spoke only of the past, the sea scrolls begged riddles, the clouds turned to stone, and the earth became a lakefront mirage. After what storm would doves then fly? If the afterlife has no after, if we can't escape or transcend, if even our demons are part of this world, then nothing living, not even our angels, will survive to forget us. If death is simply tabula rasa, then life is a kernel that will never guess its husk. If then is if, and if is then, then rain dreams up from the soil, even if this light through the vines belongs only here, to this garden, spade, rose, this lonesome rose. <clears throat> this, this next poem is a, it's a new one, uh, more of a nocturne. Um, it came after uh, a hard storm, uh, you know, crashed through. Uh, it's partly inspired by this other poem called Downburst, but it's called, it's called Faith. <clears throat> the night of blankets and lanterns, of footsteps, of partial shadows, the night of the crooked mirror, the night of the chase, of running in wide circles after the dog, then talking him down, then luring him to pillows, the night of bourbon, of solitaire, of cranking the shortwave, of late news, of torn newspaper, the night of logs crackling, of ember on ember, the night of my book and of my pencil, the whimsical tale, the comet's tale, the night of the deadbolt, the night the shingles blew off. This um, is a longer poem I wrote that uh, it was inspired by T.S. Eliot's, you know, idea of, uh, of home. Um, and his, actually a quote that he wrote, you may be familiar with. He says, uh, 
we shall not cease from exploration. And the end of all our exploring will be to arrive where we started and know the place for the first time. Um, so this is, this is house and heart. After a while, everything returns to where it began. The same station, street, house and heart. Rhymes that persist in brush strokes. A kite against a cobalt sky. The ballet of dolphins just beyond the waves. Before long, your train arrives and you begin to ponder all the reasons austerity rebuilt the rails. Lessons of solace, of evasion. Tea and more tea, dinner at six, a good book, chair by the fire, then another day down the hatch, then take the trash to the curb. I'm never coming back, he said, slamming the door. You sit near the window, watch the trees zoom by, and soon your life plays back in fields, marshes, farms, on rooftops and shops and bars. Was it only desire? only what you build or tore down. I want you to stay, she said, taking his hand. You might have gone a different way, might have even made it to the Ferris wheel and felt a deja vu in the dunes below, a quiet force in the swaying silhouettes of the marum grass. Eventually everything bears the weight of what it is, your song, its rise and fall all the variations of letdown and triumph, hardship and recovery, new leaves and flowers that bloom and die and blow away, everything that drops from the sky, ices up, thaws out and bakes in the sun, your song endures and is refashioned. I was wrong, he said, his fist in his eyes. After a while, you begin to make sense of the weeds and debris. Why you ran or stood up, why couldn't you let go? The battle within becomes the battle beyond, the bottom, the top. What your father didn't say, what your mother did is refashioned and endures. Do you good, she said, helping him pack. You get off the train in your smart coat and comfortable shoes, amazed at the depth of the well, how everything and nothing remains. Your street beats like a drum from head to toe, calls you like it used to, drums let go, open, open the door. Okay, um, just a couple more. This, this poem is, is actually a COVID kind of poem. Um, called Reassurances. Um, and it's just about how, I guess we can get lost in time um, in different ways in our, in our own house and, and um, sometimes just miss things or, um, you know how <clears throat> it, it, time just in COVID just seems a lot different. Um, almost dusk in a quiet house, and what have you done all day but gaze out the window, pondering the pendulum of loss and gain? Why the unstruck bell doesn't matter anymore. More means less today, despite desire, or the white cat moseying through the backyard. To die a little, to live a little more than yesterday. Who can tell the difference? Grasp the incantation of bees. You parse chance and choice arriving nowhere. The light decreases, rushes inward. You admire the half-finished porch in the distance, the work suspended, the job ahead. The cat hears something in the shrubbery, freezes mid-stride with one paw in the air. That's when you pick up the phone and call a friend to say it's been too long. Um, this, this is my last poem I'll read. Um, it's, it's again a nocturne for my first collection um, called Nocturne with a Dash of Oblivion. What surrenders tonight unleashes night. 
the dryness in your throat, a scratch, the cough of silicon, footsteps in a dream, a figure untraceable, but there beneath a brave hammock of stars, the pumpkin moon close enough to carve, the figure there again, but too far, a ninja known only tonight. What listens tonight belongs tonight to air, leaves, cold, silence through the hills, to the spider weaving its silk like fingers on braille, to the cat by the window, wrapped in the lookout, burned into darkness, watching the staked fields wait for the workers. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mark. I like the dash of a Oblivion, that's that's really great. Um, our next reader is Jacqueline Jules, and she is um, an author of 50 books for young readers and five poetry collections, Field Trip to the Museum, Stronger Than Cleopatra, Ishtak Perlman's Broken String, and her most recent book, Manna in the Morning. In addition to the 50 books and five collections, her poems appear in 100 publications. Wow. So please welcome Jacqueline Jules. Thank you, Renee. I'm honored to be here tonight. Thank you to Karen, Henry, Renee, everyone at the Wordworks. You have done an amazing job throughout this pandemic, bringing poetry alive in online spaces and many thanks for all of you who have joined us this evening. I'd like to begin this evening by reading from my newest collection, Manna in the Morning. This collection examines biblical figures in the light of modern times. And this first poem considers how we might judge biblical persons today. And it's called Biblical Lies. Jacob stole his brother's birthright. Moses murdered an Egyptian. David seduced another man's wife. The Bible elevates lives marked by more than merit. Yet unlike Twitter, the Bible doesn't cancel characters. We are told to read beyond the transgression, consider the whole saga. To remember the Israelites were not abandoned after the golden calf. And each one of us is Abraham and Sarah, Isaac and Rebecca, more complex than our worst moments or our best. This next poem analyzes my obsession with time. I never feel I have enough and I always want more control. Birth order. With my feet in the stirrups and the baby's head crowning, it's too late to say, next on the list, not now. Yet every morning I grunt and push, birthing task I fret should be finished in a different order. Gym first or thesis, groceries or garbage. Will meeting A be better than meeting B? Should I floss now or later? True, the firstborn inherits more, but even twins emerge one at a time, no matter how much they fight in the womb. It did Jacob little good to hold Esau's heel. The blessing still had to be stolen. He still had to flee Canaan. And Rebecca's bid to direct destiny drove away both her sons. In this next poem, I consider the story of Joseph and how his misfortune turned to prosperity. Joseph's fortune and mine. If not for jealous brothers and a convenient pit, Joseph would have stayed in Canaan, favored by Jacob, flaunting his multicolored coat. But no worries, he found success as a slave in Egypt, 
appointed head of household until Potiphar's wife brazenly pursued his beautiful biceps. Behind bars for a crime he didn't commit, Joseph foretold dreams, serenely waiting for favor to find him again in Pharaoh's court. So if not for the pit, Potiphar's wife and prison, Joseph would not have been dressed in royal robes, welcoming his brother with generous guile. Good fortune following calamity, a phenomenon enjoyed by more than Joseph in Genesis. If I stop sniffling long enough to note where each crooked turn in the road has ended for me. If only I'd cried less when cast aside in the pit, felt less jilted by a jealous world plotting against me. Maybe, like Joseph, I too would have waited with fewer complaints for a better destiny to unfold. The story of Abraham and his near sacrifice of Isaac provides a glimpse into the evolution of religion and how people have demonstrated faith throughout time. This poem is called On the Altar and the epigram, ep epigraph is more than 140 children were sacrificed at about the same time in Peru's northern coastal region about 550 years ago, BBC News. Remains of children and llamas in Peru remind me of Abraham, how he didn't argue for Isaac the way he did for Sodom and Gomorrah, how he acquiesced, traveling three days as commanded, building an altar, binding his son. Imagine Isaac's terrified eyes until an angel appeared with new instructions which brings me back to the bodies in Peru, breastbones bent to extract 140 hearts, offered to appease an angry God, demanding what's most precious as ultimate bribe. Like a folktale reinvented around the globe, sacrifice is not confined to geographic region. From ancient times, somehow, Humans have believed we have to kill to demonstrate devotion. When the angel told Abraham to offer a ram instead, it was more than a revelation. It was a weaning. Spiritually, we were babies still sucking on our first source of sustenance. Think of how we despaired later on when the temple was destroyed and we were told we couldn't burn animals anymore. What can we put on the altar now, we cried. How do we please now? The answer still eludes us. I'd like to end this section of my reading with the last poem in Manna in the Morning, where I consider myself and how much I've learned since my youth. This is called the scripture of my life. Embarrassing episodes compiled in short narratives could fill a white Bible embossed with blue letters. Browse verses one through 20 for the list of personalities tried out in my teens, like jeans in a dressing room, discarding bell bottoms for boot cut, low waisted for high rise, size six, for size 10, only to find them all uncomfortable. Subsequent verses record hours of teach yourself guitar while watching TV, journal entries on poems never finished, hot tears over an early college rejection, a cheerleader's comment on my prom dress, the boyfriend who impregnated a classmate. It's all there including my silent mouth when an English advisor offered salvation for my Jewish soul, followed by months of pouring out the story in tall red cups at every campus party. Verse 25 tells how I waitressed half blind 
too vain to wear old glasses. Verse 40, of too few calls home after daddy's first heart attack. Don't read verse 56, where I spilled coffee at an interview, snapped at my mother-in-law, backed a car into a fence. You shouldn't be reread without wine on a Saturday night. Still, I have faith in the way one verse begot another until my present good fortune of standing on the mountain with the tablets in my hands, not sorry at all, that my days of dancing with a golden calf are gone. At this time, I'd like to read a few poems for my books. It's Ak Hurlman's Pro Pro Broken String and Stronger Than Cleopatra. Both of these collections share my journeys through grief to new beginnings. Like all poets, I have noticed the random nature of fate and like many, I have chosen to write about it. And this poem is called Random Headlines. In a zoo in Morocco, a child leans smiling against a fence to pose with the elephant who inexplicably hurls a rock at her head. The next day, a man in Philadelphia removes a storm drain and jumps, sucked 10 feet into a sewer, he miraculously survives, unlike the child in Morocco. Reading headlines each morning, I can't decide if the news defies or declares a random universe, one without predetermined years allotted each life. Something to consider as I stand in a cemetery talking to a stone on your birthday. Recall the sound of your voice in the rustle of a weeping cherry hanging overhead. Accepting the random nature of fate, we must also accept our limited ability to protect ourselves or the ones we love. Preparing for disaster. With every approaching storm, the media drones like a plane overhead, littering the airways with detailed promises of what one needs to survive. An obedient citizen, I store batteries and bottled water beside neat rows of tuna and soup, believing myself safe as long as I have duct tape. I never questioned the wisdom of preparing, never linked the responsible stash of supplies to picturing the tallest structures in my horizon collapsing in rubble on a warm September day. Until I sat in a room with a sink and a scale, watching a loved one moan on a cushioned table. My faith in bottled water has expired. I can't be comforted by duct tape. And as loss is processed, we look for reasons to hope, to believe that our loved one is safe beyond our sight. Why not? Why not believe a soul swirled in a wisp from your sweat-soaked bed like a genie released from a bottle. Is that more bizarre than all the months I trusted in chemo and radiation? Stood, head bowed, prayer book open. Why not believe a corpse is just as provisional as a cocoon? You will emerge again, test bright new wings, live somewhere lush and exotic among low-lying clouds, just like the photo on my desk, where you stand, bare-chested, arms raised, triumphant. The last three poems I'll read are from um, Stronger Than Cleopatra. And um, these first two were written a number of years ago 
They share how role models helped me, gave me the strength to go on. The old woman in the grocery store. At 38 years, I fear old age, not wrinkles or white hair, not even senility. It's the odds I object to. Additional years multiply chances of standing at a gravesite, shoveling dirt on a life I love. Growing old means outlasting others, a most unappealing idea. After the summer afternoon, pool plans were suddenly scraped for a meeting with the undertaker. Do you have a picture we can run with the obit? Should the service be indoors or out? Life is too brittle, too much like old bones that snap in the slightest fall. I hold my breath at the sight of someone who has survived the years. She is standing by the meat counter, thin, white-haired, with blue vein fingers stubbornly grasping a grocery cart. I can't help but stare as if watching a movie star choose ground beef. The Scarecrow. I used to complain about our social life, moving three times to new cities. We didn't have enough friends, or so I thought, until the morning you died and the phone rang and rang. People call, and we discuss the boys, my job, the schools, the weather, everything, but why they think of me so often. I am the widow now, the scarecrow, on a suburban lawn, like our neighbor back in Pittsburgh, widowed by a frightened deer. Remember how we sent away for those silly plastic whistles, attached them to the front bumper, charms to ward off sudden silent creatures that crash through windshields on dark winding roads. I wonder, how many neighbors and friends saw cardiologists in the weeks after your funeral? Curiosity, not criticism. Do others feel what I did in Pittsburgh months after the deer accident, seeing the widow shopping in the mall, buying clothes for a son, still growing despite his father's death? I was transfixed by the sight the widow standing up, not propped and bound to a pole, standing up, admitting good days and bad days while adjusting a battered hat and pushing straw back into an old plaid shirt, standing up on her own, standing up. And finally, a poem about accepting how each part of our lives can be distinct like the stages of metamorphosis. Wings from a chrysalis. I still find things when I clean closets, like the speckled tan tie you wore to our wedding. It has a stain, champagne perhaps. We drank that day like all young couples to a future we didn't expect to spill after 17 years on a rose-colored carpet in the middle of June. Who would I be had I not buried you? The question itches sometimes, like a coarse spot on otherwise smooth skin, as I snuggle with your replacement in a bed bigger than the one we shared. Your death reduced me to larva, but time inside a chrysalis gave me wings I would not give back. I loved my old body, but this one suits me too. And some creatures are destined to live their lives in stages, each one distinct and beautiful while it lasts. Thank you so much. 
Thank you, Jacqueline. Um, <clears throat> wow. Um, I like that corpse is provisional. That That's uh, really a good thing to think about. Anyway, it, we've come to the close of our uh, show tonight. Um, Karen, do you have anything that you want to add? Where are you? No? Okay. Um, please join us. I want to thank you all, all our excellent, excellent readers. We're really blessed to have you uh, all read to us tonight. Um, I want to thank you all for coming out tonight. And um, like I said before, hopefully uh, next year we'll be uh, and in person. Um, I want to thank my co-hosts, Karen Alanier and Henry Crawford, and be sure to return to our upcoming uh, WordWorks reading next week. Uh, we'll have June 21st, Thursday. We'll host the fourth and final evening of this year's Joaquin Miller Poetry Series, featuring Sandra Beasley, Miss Cayenne, and Bonnie Narze. We'll send you a Zoom link a few days before, but and please feel free to share it with your friends, but we ask that you don't share it with social media. Uh, we don't want any Zoom bombing. Um, on Wednesday, July 21st at seven, we'll have the Poets versus the Pandemic, and that will feature Miles David Moore, Lucinda Marshall, and Ann Becker. Finally, on July 12th, the WordWorks Cafe Muse will have a special reading of poems from the Arlington Anthology. Thank you all again for joining us tonight, and we hope to see you next week. Stay well and stay safe.